Um, my name is Professor Patrick Kayser. I'm the head of La Trobe Law School. I'm absolutely delighted to um, uh, welcome you uh, and our special guests uh, to tonight's event on big data, privacy and artificial intelligence. Uh, before we commence, I'd like to um, uh, uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered tonight and pay my respects to their elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, on behalf of uh, our university, I'd like to uh, warmly welcome you here tonight. Uh, we apologise for the late start, uh, a bit to do with the weather and a bit to do with the traffic. Uh, not that we ever have uh, those problems in Melbourne, of course. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this event because uh, we all know that recent advancements in big data and artificial intelligence are quickly defining uh, what life is like in our world. Uh, rapid acceleration in their development and even quicker advancements in their application have led to a, a new era of possibility. Big data is the fuel that powers artificial intelligence, but as machines are made smarter, we're beginning to ask, what exactly does our right to privacy look like in this digital day and age? Uh, I feel personally conflicted uh, because my teenagers uh, use social media and I like to keep an eye on them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I do acknowledge their right to privacy. So we're struggling today to find privacy in such a technology-driven world, but we're now faced with complex legal and ethical issues raised when machines are capable of making decisions. Who is responsible? How can we determine when a decision has been made? And how can we ensure that these decisions aren't manipulated? So I look forward to welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Joseph Kanatachi, shortly. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel members for this evening, and I'd invite you to join me on the stage, if you would. Uh, the first is Professor David Watts, who is a Professor of Information Law and Policy at our law school, our La Trobe Law School. Uh, David was the um, Commissioner for Privacy and Data Protection for the Victorian <laughs> Government until he saw the light and uh, came to La Trobe Law School. Um, our, our second uh, panellist tonight is Mira Stammers, who is a lecturer at La Trobe Law School. Uh, uh, Mira is a legal disruptor. She set up a uh, innovative disruptive law firm called Legally Yours uh, and has uh, won many awards for her innov innovation in the legal profession. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Dr Bridget Bainbridge, a good friend of La Trobe Law School, uh, head of uh, Bainbridge and Associates who are privacy law experts who are very, very busy, as you might imagine. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Professor Joe uh, Kanatachi, who was appointed United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy in July 2015. Uh, uh, Professor Kanatachi is the head of the Department of Information Policy and Governance at the Faculty of Media and Knowledge Sciences of the University of Malta. He also holds the Chair of European Information Policy and Technology Law uh, within the Faculty of Law at the University of Groningen, where he co-founded the STEP Research Group. Um, he also holds the Chair of European Information Policy and Technology Law at that law school, uh, and we are absolutely delighted to welcome him here tonight. Please give him a warm Melbourne welcome. Good afternoon. No, I should say good evening. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. I would like to ask the technical crew to put my slides on um, and uh, I can then move forward. There we are. Okay, so as you can see, um, when Professor Watts uh, uh, gave me the title, I kind of stopped at who is responsible for decisions made, made by machines, or oh, I haven't yet bought a Tesla. Um, and the reason is quite simple, because there's at least one, no, possibly two people in the audience whom I've had a chat with, and I know exactly why they didn't buy a Tesla. They love the car like I did, but it keeps on sending data back to Tesla. And when you ask them, can you switch that off, please? The answer is no. Now, and I'm not sure that that's the kind of data gathering I'd like to have about me. And of course, the reason given to me was, it's all because of AI. You see, the car needs to continue to learn. Um, I wanted to see if today's talk is going to be more, you know, AI versus lawyers. So actually, I have a couple of questions to ask. And I'm going to walk around a bit because I've been 
in those aluminium tubes we call planes for far too long over the past several days. So let me see. <clears throat> How many people in the audience have a legal background? Okay, don't be shy. Okay, so there we are. We've got lots of lawyers around. And how many are techies? Ooh, the techies rule the roost today. Very good. Okay. Now, as you probably know, I have to plead guilty to both, right? So I'm a chartered software engineer and I've spent far too many hours in front of screens and on the road designing systems, systems which work. Um, but I, yes, I would plead guilty to three law degrees or whatever, and uh, having worked for a long time trying to get people to see the light, you know, which is uh, marrying the disciplines of information technology and law. And in fact, you know, I just wondered how many of you uh, can recognize this person. No prizes are being awarded um, because. Um, he declared himself to be in an arms race, an arms race with Russia. And if you had to look at the fine print in a bit more detail, you would have seen that he was claiming to be in an arms race using AI, right? So AI is here being claimed that is going to be used to combat misinformation. But there is one small point where I would disagree with Professor Kayser, who spoke before me and who gave me such a kind introduction. And it's not a big point, I suspect, but he was talking about AI as if it's all recent, right? And I must say, when I agreed this title with David Watts, you know, several months ago, it seems now, um, he took me back down memory lane. And let me show you why, you see, because... Um, just after my first book on privacy and law, that's 31 years ago, 32 years ago, my second book was Liability and Responsibility for Expert Systems, right? And that's precisely 30 years ago. Um, which means to say, and then I, I just found a few of my other publications going back, AI and society, and we see that's exactly today's title, you know, who is responsible for when something goes wrong, right? Um, and then I went back and then saw that knowledge skill, artificial intelligence, that's 88, law and expert systems. And oh Lord, I suspect by 1989, 90, I was getting already a bit sick and tired of this because frankly, if you had to ask me, what kind of progress have we made? And this is for the lawyers in the room, right? Um, what kind of progress have we made when it comes to AI and deciding who's responsible, the answer is not much. Frankly, we're going to have to revisit all that stuff from 30 years ago, find out whether I can disagree with myself, and then see whether we have to develop new legal rules. Some things have changed, right? Because when you ask yourself about AI, and especially about robotics, what do you expect a robot to look like? Do you expect it to look like this? Or perhaps like that. Or perhaps like this. Because um, when we see how AI actually manifests itself, right, it's really uh, quite interesting to see what we have produced. But we have Stephen Hawking warning that artificial intelligence could end mankind, in which case, of course, the lawyers would be out of business because we wouldn't have anybody to sue, right? Um, and because in reality, when you're looking at a remedy, you know, you go to an engineer and you can ask them, you can half expect they're going to fix things. Um, you go to a lawyer, basically lawyers only know about three things, you know, money, sex, and power. Remove those three things and lawyers out, are out of business, right? And so when you get something really deep, like will AI kill or save humankind, you just have to look a bit of where we are these days, right? Because I have heard a lot of my Australian friends, and now I've been coming to Australia for more than 10 years. I really like it here. You know, I've admitted openly a special rapporteur is supposed to be independent, and I've admitted my bias. You know, I love Australia, so that's a bias. But are Australians going to be smart or are they going to be dumb? And in, when we find ourselves in these two competing cities, right, Sydney and Melbourne, 
are these going to be smart cities? So today I've built my presentation a bit around smart cities. And some of you who may have, who may have heard may, may recognize a couple of slides. But um, when you look at when you see a headline like that, Google's plan to revolutionize cities is a takeover in all but name. Now remember, there's absolutely no competition between Sydney and Melbourne, right? Um, and um, I'm sure you recognize the same news that I saw this morning. Somebody was rather proud that the economy of Victoria has become number one again, and New South Wales is now number two again. So there's, there is really no competition. But which of these two cities is going to be smart now, right? Because you see, when you look at Google's plan, Google offered to take over whole sections of cities in Canada and the United States. And of course, you know, um, what was it? Brutus was an honorable man. Um, you see, when we think about self-driving cars, that's another form of AI and robot that we're talking about, which is why I started off on Teslas. But let me stop you for a minute. Has anybody noticed an advertising campaign on the streets of Melbourne and Sydney recently? Yes, haven't you? It's all about friends, isn't it? Hmm, yes, I thought as much. Because I've managed to rescue this screen from when Cambridge Analytica was still in business. To be precise, I downloaded the screen on the 22nd of March, right? Now, look carefully at those two words. Data drives all we do, but it's not their data, it's your data. And secondly, look at the two words in red and blue. No coincidence either, right? Commercial or political? Because what was going on there was the use of people's data gathered surreptitiously to persuade them to make different decisions. Either Look at the blue decisions, commercial decisions, or political decisions, the red ones. And the rather creepy thing about this was that if we were to look at my fellow panelists for the evening, right, and somehow all of us, except Bridget, have, without agreeing, got red somewhere in our... But, you see, what is the significance of the data of those 85 million people that were used for Cambridge Analytica. The significance was that if it was David, if it was Mira, it was Bridget and myself, and we all lived next to each other in the same street or indeed on different streets, the people who are buying the service from Cambridge Analytica were also buying a service which targeted David and gave him a message that they thought that he wanted to hear, targeted Mira and gave her a message which they thought she wanted to hear, Bridget the same, me the same, which meant different messages. So the really interesting thing about the Trump campaign or indeed the Brexit campaign is not that somebody was buying data taken surreptitiously. The most interesting part of that case is that you had thousands, tens of thousands, we haven't counted exactly how much yet, the investigation is ongoing, of different messages crafted to different people. And you'll see that that's part of what I want you to think about today. And I'm going to zip through these because it's the normal jazz about Facebook and analytic and so on. And then I'm going to come back a bit to privacy and big data, right? Um, because this is going back to in my report of last year, that's the um, Human Rights Council Chamber in Geneva. I think that's actually me at the back, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, last year I was asking people to think quite carefully about the needs to have new rules. And I'm not going to go into the rules, because I somehow guess there are going to be more techies in the audience than the lawyers, right? So not too much law today. But let's look at the thinking around it and conceptual frameworks, right? Because, and here I went back to my projects. This is the day job. This is what actually makes sure that the rent gets paid. Um, 
And so this is smart project, smart surveillance. And this this is a family photo from the smart project, right? And this is me, what, yeah, nearly 10 years ago. But this is in uh, at Interpol headquarters in France. Those are some of the 58 team members I had on that project. And what we're doing, we're looking at smart surveillance. And I want to take you a bit from smart surveillance to smart cities, right? Because if I stop there for a minute, and I want you to look first on the left and see all the types of data that I managed to squeeze in on a screen, and then on the right, the operational applications, and what's going on in the middle, those three basic functions, right? People are matching, people are storing, people are sharing, they're matching, they're storing, they're sharing, right? And what's all this in aid of, okay? So about 10 years ago, I started working on this principle of Mimsy, you know, who was also one of my students. There was a little bit of a joke there, but she was doing cybercrime in Botswana. Um, but what I'm talking about is massively integrated multiple sensor installation. So walk through Melbourne and think of a Melbourne with sensors at each and every meter, half a meter, 10 meters. And each sensor is picking up data about you. It's a so-called Internet of Things. Some sensors are going to pick up data about your voice. Some are going to pick up things from your clothes. Have you seen the new range of Tommy Hilfiger, right? They're actually building sensors into them to know how long you've worn your tracksuit. So do be careful, right? I used to rather like Hilfiger as a make, but... Um, the latest no news is quite creepy because basically, you know, it, we're back again to that old song by the police. Every step you take, you know, every breath you make, I'll be watching you. Because, in fact, it's when we start linking video from CCTV to audio from microphones in and on the ground. And those are, are only just some of the sensors, right? Um, that you then collect them in more or one control room with several databases that you get to MIMSI with geolocation built in. And many of you recognize Edward Snowden, who as of the 6th of June 2013, began revealing more things about what's going on, right? But let's get back, you know, to Vint Cerf, right? Most of you have recognized Vint here, right? Uh, Vint Cerf was an extremely intelligent person um, and uh, one of the founders of the internet, but who said something which I still can't quite understand. I think he's backtracking a bit now, but originally he said something quite wrong, right? That privacy may actually be an anomaly. Now let's read this carefully and think about it. Privacy is a construct of the modern industrial age. In the past, his thinking goes, people lived in small self-contained villages where pretty much everyone knew who was dating the baker's daughter and what the sheriff had for lunch. It is only when populations started migrating en masse to cities that anonymity emerged as a byproduct of urbanization. Now, first of all, let's be quite clear that anonymity and privacy are two different things, right? Privacy is a much wider concept, and I'll be trying to tackle some of that as we go along. In one of my more recent books, I tried to offer a conceptual framework of time, place, and space. And in that book, I've tried to train, you know, trying to discern many reasons why Vint Cerf would be wrong, including the fact that I have found privacy to be alive and well all over the world, even in civilizations, even in the jungle, even in places where people don't have the word for privacy in the language. Um, but you can go to that and look at an even more recent book, Privacy, Free Expression and Transparency, because we've traced some of the links there between these separate human rights, privacy and free expression. Um, very quickly, the main thing that we're seeing today is 
how fast things go. So the next point I want to make about AI and privacy is how fast things are going. And the means, you know, how quickly went from 1 billion people on Facebook to 2 billion people on Facebook. And the fact, more importantly, is that we're carrying everything in our pocket, right? That everything has gone mobile. That 90% of people accessing Facebook are doing it on mobile. That's the real news. And the same applies to how fast Snapchat started for passing Twitter. The most important things on these slides are not the headlines, but are the dates. 2nd June 2016, Snapchat passes Twitter. Snapchat closes this on Facebook as it hits 6 billion daily views. And you see the date that is November 2015. Then you go January, three months later, catching up. Then you go catching up, passing it, caught up, and within another two months has gone past uh, Facebook on two million a day. That's how fast things are going, right? That you gain the number, the billion of views more than the users here because people are getting paid according to the billions of views. Um, which is why I would like to sit back and think whether Peter Smyre is right as to whether we're living in the golden age of surveillance, right? Um, and this is something I've done once in Australia before. So some of you may have heard me um, read this, but I'm going to do it again because I think that it's very instructive, right? This goes back to my days, right? Uh, when I was a boy, Solzhenitsyn wrote this. As every man goes through life, he fills in a number of forms for the record, each containing a number of questions. There are thus hundreds of little threads radiating from every man, millions of threads in all. If these threads were suddenly to become visible, the whole sky would look like a spider's web. And if they materialized like rubber bands, buses and trams and even people would lose the ability to move and the wind would be unable to carry torn up newspapers or autumn leaves along the streets of the city. Now this is Solzhenitsyn writing before computers, writing before the web. This is 1968, if I remember. And this is about data, information that people give. The very verb in Latin, datum, something given. You fill in a form. But what about all the information that you're giving away without filling in any forms? And that is what I would like you to think about when you think about big data, right? Because smart cities make Solzhenitsyn's concern look minuscule, right? It's not only the forms that we fill, it's the electronic tracks that we leave everywhere and of which most of us are never conscious, right? And you see, because we have a problem in English and that's up till now, if you look up the English dictionary, well, the last time I did, there was not the word surveillable. The French got there before, surveillable, right? But English must catch up with French because what we're doing is, since we're always online, we're making ourselves surveillable. You see, you know, inside, we're online. We go outside, we're online. And people are always online, you know? I found this slide and I thought you'd enjoy it, you know? Um, <laughs> Always online, right? So um, it's very interesting that we're test. And in fact, colleagues of mine in the audience did find recent pictures of all things that God is supposed to be doing with data. But let's leave that for another day. But you see, um, the message here is that we all leave a digital footprint, right? And the concern, very sweetly brought up in this uh, Ogilvy Design cartoon, is that once it's online, it's virtually impossible to scrub out. This is what indeed the research tells us people think. And the data on you will follow you around for life. Right? So when we're thinking about big data and what it can do by bringing all this data around you out there, you have to think how that's going to impact your privacy. Which brings us to the question that I'm asking, are smart cities worth the risk? And I don't have time because you know I, I want to make sure I've agreed with David Watson and others that we're going to try and keep me within reasonable limits so people can talk and chat and criticize and ask. Um, it would, I could spend a week just going in, to, in and out the technicalities of smart cities, dissecting them and examining the threat they present to privacy. People will tell you some of those are a good thing. There could be benefits to humanity. 
but is it worth the risk, right? Which I wanted to explain to you something that has happened between the last time I was talking about these things in Australia two years ago, before this week, that is, um, and this. Because last time I was talking about these, the three legs of the stool. Yeah, please forgive the artwork, but um, you have three legs to the stool. These are the three, to the lawyers in the room, these are the three information-related fundamental human rights, privacy, freedom of expression, and freedom of information, upholding, holding up an overarching right, the right to free, unhindered development of personality. Because I would like each one of you to ask yourself, yes, privacy is a right, of course, but is it an, an end in itself? Or is it there as an enabling right? And in fact, what happened in March 2017 is that for the first time in United Nations discourse, we got everything coming together. I was very pleased that following a speech I had made in March of 2016, within the year, we got this resolution passed unanimously at the United Nations. And I would read it once again to see how the things are brought together. Recognizing the right to privacy also as an enabling right to the free development of personality. And in this regard, noting with concern that any violation to the right to privacy might affect other human rights, including the right to freedom of expression and to hold opinions without interference, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. And I'd like to go in a bit deeper into this, right? And to do that, I'm going to read this excerpt from Paul Seekhart, which is going to make you think of Cambridge Analytica, I hope, except that Seekhart wrote this in 1983, right? 35 years before we got to Cambridge Analytica. Let's read that. In a society where modern information technology is developing fast, many others may be able to find out how we act. And that, in turn, may reduce our freedom to act as we please. Because once others discover how we act, they may think that it is in their interest or in the interest of society, or even in our own interest, to dissuade us, discourage us, or even stopping us from doing what we want to do and seek to manipulate us to do what they want to do. Cambridge Analytica, anybody? And then, since, as I told you, David Watt's suggestion for this lecture made me go down memory lane, I found something that I wrote like 32 years ago, and after 32 years, please forgive me, please indulge me, I still can't disagree with myself. So let's, let, let, let me read this to you. So in commenting, I was commenting on Paul Seekhart, I said this, shorn of the cloak of privacy that protects him, an individual becomes transparent and therefore manipulable. A manipulable individual is at the mercy of those who control the information held about him. And his freedom, which is often relative at best, shrinks in direct proportion to the extent of the nature of the options and alternatives which are left open to him by those who control the information. And this, I would hope, will help us bring into sharper focus why big data and AI in a smart city will help increase the risks. Because, as you can see, if we try to tie things together, the right to, what we're talking about here is the right to free development of personality, but also of autonomy, autonomy as a value. And self-determination as part of the conceptual framework of autonomy. And the right of self-determination as a value emanating from the value of autonomy is linked, if you want to think about it, the right to, to political self-determination, except when we're talking about privacy, we're talking about informational self-determination. And what I would like to suggest to the architects in the room, and there were architects in Sydney when I was talking about this a week ago, 
I'd like to think of that informational self-determination should be a design criteria for smart cities, because otherwise we're going to lose quality of life. And otherwise, I suggest we're going to be stupid about smart cities, right? Um, and, you know, try Googling images for smart cities and try to understand all the benefits there. But the key question is the final bullet point. Will the aggregation of all data in a smart city lead to an unacceptable deterioration of our quality of life? Because is this going to be smart everything except us, right? Um, smart buildings, smart mobility, smart public services, smart water, smart energy. But us? Are we going to be smart? Um, I could go on about smart cities, but let me zip through, right? Because I want to remind you about the so-called social contract. I want to take you back a bit, even to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right? And to Contrat Social, right? Because has anybody come along to ask you and said, hey, listen, I'd like to rewrite the social contract. I'd like to rewrite the contract between society and the individual. Because the question I'm asking is quite simple. Have the last 10 years of the internet already changed the social contract? And to be precise, have you felt at the same level parity of arms when negotiating with a company every time they asked you, do you agree with my privacy policy? Did you like the negotiating stance? Were they flexible with you? Or did, was it take it or leave it? And the same with governments. Have governments been asking you permission to take your data on the internet to put you under surveillance? Because frankly, if you've noticed it, I must have been asleep. And what I put it, what I'm suggesting to you is that neither governments nor corporations have gone out of their way to have an open discussion in society about this kind of thing. And I'm therefore suggesting that the social contract is in, at risk of being changed without discussion or consent. Let me, I'm running out of time, and as usual, I've put in too many slides, and I do that deliberately, because normally there are questions from the audience that say, ah, yes, but let me take you to that slide, right? So, basically, while the Europeans are busy trumpeting the notions of privacy by design, which is now part of law in Europe, Article 26 of the GDPR has privacy by design, which means, of course, that anybody in Australia who wants to sell big data and AI systems in Europe must, co must comply with the principles of privacy by design and privacy by default. But when you look at your cities, ladies and gentlemen, are you designing smart cities? Um, what exactly is happening here? We're all on the way to becoming stupidly surveillable, because they're surveillable and then they're stupidly surveillable, right? Um, I'm going to quickly go to the end, because I'd like to leave much more time for the panel. And so I'm going to skip Edward Snowden, ex case core, and everything about telling where, what you're saying, what you're doing, basically, you can be watched from your device. This data is now five years old. There are many more sites, many more servers. But do you remember this, anybody? I thought, you didn't, I thought this was amusing, right? Is this what Mr. Zuckerberg is saying today? Has he changed his tune? And if so, why? Because if you go to Facebook, they love your privacy today. They're not saying it's over. Right. So what happened in the look at the date on that, January nine, two thousand and ten. I doubt if you go I, I saved that in my archives of course, because I doubt if you go today you're going to find it. Because I'm going back to conclude with where I started off on memory lane, David. So I said so what's happened since nineteen eighty seven? What what's the paradigm shift, right? So first of all, the technology 
has supposedly put you and me in charge, right? It's changed the nature of interactions. It's no longer ABC out there saying stuff and you listening. It's now you and me generating content, which is a radical change, right? UGC, user-generated content. It's created new classes of service providers, search engines and other entities, which have completely changed the way that you go about life and all the data that you produce, right? And then we have the convergence of technologies, especially smartphones, right? Cameras, video, GPS, and yes, they even make a phone call every so often, right? But, and I wanted to ask you what you think about this, and perhaps the panel will pick this up. Is this 2015 statement correct? In the world of big data, is privacy invasion the business model? Because if it is, and we're going for it without discussing it, then we really must be done, right? And we're back to the golden age of surveillance. Um, I'll ask you to go to my website, the UN website, and download a bunch of stuff, including our report on, you'll see it on the right-hand corner, Surveillance, Big Data, and Open Data, which Professor David Watts here was chairing the group, which um, authored that. And in that report, which I first presented in October of 2017, then to the United Nations uh, General Assembly, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff, big data and open data, right? And if we went into it, you would see that in these set of priorities, the set of five priorities that I set my uh, mandate, you see that big data and open data is one of those priorities. And it's the reason why I'm here in Australia this time. So um, I'm going to conclude with these slides which first of all tackle the so-called GDPR. I'm sure somebody may ask about GDPR, but basically when it comes to GDPR and surveillance, you're not going to get very far because the GDPR was not intended to deal with surveillance by governments, right? It's intended to deal with a whole bunch of things, but not surveillance certainly by secret services or anything for national security. Neither mass versus targeted surveillance. But what I would do is I would say and what I've been trying to persuade people when it comes to how you protect yourself in a society where AI and big data are deployed, I would say think about encryption, use encryption, um, and this in my conclusion, you have five ideas to prevent the transition from surveillable to surveilled, right? First of all, we need to develop safeguards to prevent everybody becoming surveilled. Secondly, we need to develop and adopt disincentives for automated profiling. And each time I ask you, how do you do this in the age of big data and AI? We've got to fund the research. We've got to integrate privacy as part of a, the value system of the right to free development of personality. And we've got to have design guidelines to develop privacy-friendly smart cities, right? Um, and we go back to Paul Seekhard and myself, and I'm not even going to go here, don't go look at what I'm saying, look at what Paul Seekhard is saying. What's information policy? So Professor David Watts is Professor of Information Policy. What's that? And it's a question of encouraging the right information flows and discouraging the wrong ones. So that is what I hope we're going to be discussing during the panel today. Because from an information policy point of view, the internet grew inorganically. And also using big data has made us infinitely more surveillable. And we are now considering whether society should intervene through a properly thought out information for society which is always online. And smart cities risk growing inorganically and risk making us stupidly surveillable. And Latrobe, the discussion we're having today and earlier today, one at the University of Melbourne, are part of the structured discussion as to where, when, and how, rather than if, we should intervene to relevant evidence-based information policy. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and I wish you well. I'm looking forward to the discussion now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, David Watts, uh, La Trobe Law School's Professor of Information Law and Policy, uh, will chair a uh, short Q&A session. David, I'll let you take over. I've got a couple of questions of Joe, and I've got a couple of questions for our panellists. Um, and, uh, and then I'd like uh, us to be able to um, address and deal with the questions that you have. So, Joe, the, the, the first question that I've got is um, you mentioned your, the report on surveillance, big data and open data that you presented to the UN General Assembly last year. Since that time, we've had Cambridge Analytica and we've had Brexit and we've had um, proof of how we're being manipulated and micro-targeted um, using techniques like big data. And you've, had, um, you've been in Australia the last 10 days on a consultation to try and finalise that report. Let us in on some secrets about how you think that that report, that final report, um, might be structured and what it might focus on. OK. So no tweeting for now, everybody, right? <laughs> um, because he's asked for some... Um, well, it's been a very interesting journey, especially last Thursday and Friday, because I came to Australia because Australia, I think, is going to receive the prize for the most stupid thing done with medical data and open data. <laughs> not the consumer data right. No, I'm not talking about the consumer data right, because, you see, in the report, you will have noticed that we didn't talk about big data alone, because big data is a very big subject. But we talked about specifically big data and open data together. Because unfortunately for society, what's happened, and I think we should perhaps be thinking about writing this in the following way, people have hijacked the, the notion of open data. Open data was originally linked to something I had in my first book, you know, 32 years ago, whenever it was, which was open government, government in the sunshine, right? Whereas the whole idea was that you put out data out there to make government more transparent. But hang on, how is publishing my medical data going to make government more transparent? It doesn't satisfy that part of me which is a techie doesn't satisfy that part of me which is a lawyer. So what have we learned? We've learned that one, publishing the data of two million Australians online, publishing their medical data for 30 years, including every single prescription, including every single visit to the gynecologist, including every single report on abortion, etc. Publishing that online was probably one of the dumbest ideas anybody ever had. So, I'm going to give you one out of ten recommendations, the rest, you know, come back for more later, um, is there's certainly going to be a recommendation that that should never take place, that that should never have taken place, that ne that should never take place again, and to put it as succinctly as I can, no record unit level data should be released at that level as a form of open data. Because, um, and this is something else which I've now crystallized over the past year, David, 30 years ago, when I was chairman of the Committee of Experts on Data Protection of the Council of Europe, I was busy writing in safeguards, I thought. And the, safeguard, the safeguards then were anonymization. The truth is that today, with big data techniques, the more data sets you have out there, the less possible true anonymization is. Because re-identification 
is really very much easier. And what's happened is Australia, through the efforts of researchers here in Melbourne, at the University of Melbourne, showed that that data of 2 million Australians put online as part of an open data scheme was too risky, it could be re-identified, and that should never have been done. So thank you, Australia. No thank you to the people who taught that up. Health data has also been um, in, the, in the news um, because of my health record. And, uh, and although, although Bridget has no advance warning of this question, um, Bridget, uh, Bridget spent a goodly period of her, her life um, doing the policy work on the development of, uh, of what was then the personally controlled electronic health record. And I remember the, 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 the sort of policy work that was done and the care that was taken with privacy. And yet we, we end up with a situation now where it appears that the police can just look us up and find out what our, what our, our health records are. Um, we also have um, uh, what passes for a debate in this country where we're told, look, that's never happened and it never will happen, even though it's legal. <coughs> and, and Bridget, I was wondering if you could speak, I suppose, to some of the causes of where we get to a situation where we release um, in apparently de-identifiable form, but not really in de-identifiable form, enormous data sets of health information, but how we reach a, a point where we are with e-health, um, which I think raises policy questions and questions about how we frame debates and how we use language. How we don't do policy debates in Australia. And how we don't do policy debates in Australia. That could be one of them. Um, I don't usually like talking about e-health because I have to say, after I'd been there about five years, it had totally done my head in and I was tired of uh, trying to get people to just start from really basic principles so that we could have a proper uh, discussion about these things. Um, Joe, you mentioned, though I have to say this first, the competition between Melbourne and Sydney. Well, when I first came to privacy, I think it was like 96, um, and fell into a job where I then ended up drafting Victoria's information uh, privacy. Well, it was a bill that never got through. Um, so that's like 20 years ago. And I remember that the, the only reason, like I, I, maybe I am more cynical now, but I think the only reason that Victoria did privacy was because it was seen as being um, an advantage on the information highway and information economy and all the words that we used to use to describe those sort of, you know, early internet days. The information superhighway. The information superhighway, yeah. How could I get that wrong? Um, so, you know, privacy, was, along with security, um, you know, always had that ampersand in the middle, were the two things that people regularly said they were concerned about. But that was uh, over a number of years, um, if you actually tried to drill down into that, people weren't able to explain what they felt about privacy. And that's why I actually have enormous sympathy for the sorts of things that you've spoken out about, Joe, because I think it is those less obvious, less tangible elements of privacy. And perhaps something they've got in Germany about you know, the right to develop your personality that we definitely don't have in Australia. Um, but if you look at the history of e-health, there's uh, always been a legal reason. Like, so let's, I know privacy is a law, but let's leave privacy aside. There's a legal reason why you can't share MBS and PBS data. It's always been like that. And it was deliberately, um, the legislation was drafted in that way because there were concerns about what would happen if you put those two databases together because you would get medical history and you would get like, people's um, prescription history. Um, there were regular reviews. At one point, I think there were annual reviews where uh, government I and mean, anyone else who was interested in uh, opening up those databases could go and make the case. They could go and argue for all the reasons why MBS and PBS should be, um, you know, it should be possible to join them together. Um, and having been there at most of those uh, sessions, um, which were overseen by the then Privacy Commissioner, the argument was never made, was never accepted. There were usually only two organisations who would argue for that data to be used in that way. That was the Department of Health and Ageing and I think it was like Medicare Australia. So over a number of years, using the available legal mechanisms, 
there was no traction for this idea of combining those two databases. And of course, they're seen as the way to create your um, nascent e-health record. Leave aside uh, medical liability issues about whether it's going to be accurate, but um, you can see that there's been a long history in those two databases. So what happens? Open data and big data come along and there's, it was seen as an opportunity to release this data at last, to get around the law because of course it's de-identified data um, that was going to be released. Um, but I think those of us who knew what the legal background was could see all along that it was going to end in disaster. So it wasn't just our colleagues from the University of Melbourne who you know, re-identified it within 24 hours. Um, it's also the fact that government has refused to accept or acknowledge that a breach was involved. That if you release uh, a data set like that that contains sensitive personal information and we know that it can be joined, we know that up with other data to reveal identity, we know that it can be reverse engineered to re-identify it, there can be no justification um, to release it. And in fact, to release it is not just a breach of privacy, it's a breach of the legislation that says these two data sets should not be published together. Slightly long answer, but yeah, you shouldn't get me started on e-health, David, you know that. So, so well, no, no, I thought it was a good conversation starter. Um, so, so, you've touched on some of the, um, some of the, 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 the fundamental underpinnings of, of privacy, such as rights to self-determination, et cetera, et cetera. So if I can just ask Joe. Um, Australia is the only Western democracy without a Bill of Rights, um, and we're one of the few Western countries, correct me, without um, a, 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 a tort right, um, a, a right to sue for, for invasions of privacy. Do you think that the fact that we don't have those legal an anchors in terms of rights or in terms of an ability um, to sue and for there to be consequences, do you think that that has perhaps fueled some of the some of the the, the silliness in, in in Australia that serves as an example for what not to do? Possibly yes, um, or I should say yes, yes, and possibly yes. Just think of the way that the Europeans have changed the law over the past forty years. The Europeans realized that money talks when it comes to companies, and therefore they've increased the, the fines hugely to make it a strong disincentive to companies to monkey around with people's data. So, and this, I would remind you, is in a Europe where citizens have all kinds of remedies which Australian citizens, speaking frankly, do not have, mm. right? So, by an accident of geography and geology, Australia is where it is, and therefore, ask yourself the question, what would have happened had Australia, instead of being where it is, been exactly like it is, but sitting off the coast of Europe just next to the UK, right? Just to give the Brits, you know, um, a fair idea of what a, a really decent sized island should be like. Right? <laughs> and, and at that stage, Australians would have had normally, because every single uh, European country has one, they would have had a constitution with a Bill of Rights saying clearly you are a human being and therefore you have the fundamental right to privacy because at this moment in time Australia is dependent on its government having signed an international treaty the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights but then to what extent has the Australian government really abided by its obligations to put into law the right to privacy is a very moot point. Secondly, Australian citizens would have had not only the right, so the government makes a dumb law, let's take it 
to court mm -hmm. because the law doesn't meet the standards set out in the Bill of Rights. But if even the, the Supreme Court of the land gets it wrong, Australian citizens would have been able to do, like uh, French citizens and German citizens and um, uh, Maltese citizens and British citizens till now, um, take them to the European Court of Human Rights and say, listen, my government has been dumb. Mm -hmm. It's been unfair. Um, and it's done this. How can Australia do that? You're not in the right region to do so. Yeah. So it makes it even more important, I would have thought, that the Australian government puts its money where its mouth is and says, look, I'm going to respect the intelligence of my citizens. I would like to give them a legal framework which they deserve as human beings, as people who have dignity, as people who have the right to develop their personality, and these are the rights. So, to go back to Cambridge Analytica, and I'll stop my intervention here, you will have noticed, most people in the room who have followed the discussion will have noticed, that Cambridge Analytica has been already, and Facebook, more importantly, has been found so guilty of the most obscene of crimes uh, against um, uh, actions, let me take back the word crimes, um, in this case um, against privacy, that they were awarded the maximum fine that they could under the old law, which was half a million. Had it been under the new law, that's 4% of Facebook's turnover, which makes anybody say, ah, because that's the, you know, that's the GDP of a small country. And, and Joe, I noticed um, last uh, Friday, um, Facebook's share price diminished by 20%. Yeah. And, and, and that was while your conference or while your consultation was going on, and I was sort of thinking there must have been a linkage between, mm, I'm sorry. between the brokers. <laughs> between the brokers. Please don't give well. Mr. Zuckerberg any ideas. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't that. I think, I think, I think what you're seeing is um, a very natural consequence was Twitter then was suffering too. There are tech, there are issues with the tech market going on. Is it too much, too little? Things which have not been helped certainly by the Cambridge Analytica stat. Because frankly, people are saying that they might have to rethink the business model, right? And this is something where we might be have heading for. And I'm holding discussions with the companies again uh, September, putting them all in a room and telling them, you know, let's discuss the business models to see how you can continue to make money, but now it's no longer to be a free-for-all. So, so talking about recasting business models, um, so Mira has been involved in um, disrupting legal markets and in um, um, the use of big data, um, the use of um, new technology, how is that affecting that particular industry? Well, if we think about um, AI in particular, it's probably uh, new to the legal profession or to the legal services market. Probably so, some would say that the High Court is, is <laughs> characterised by artificial intelligence. <laughs> but but um, I, I think that's because it's probably one of the last industries to be disrupted in this sense because of the nature of the legal profession. Um, having said that, it's probably infiltrating the profession in about four different areas. So obviously we're seeing it in document review and discovery, in due diligence, um, also seeing it in legal research and analytics, um, and interestingly in predictive analytics. And to kind of demonstrate that it's ample, there was a couple of recent experiments which were really interesting. So in the UK, um, Cambridge University came up with an AI platform, Case Crunch, and they decide to pit that against 112 of the top London commercial lawyers and see who would win. So they got them to review 775 um, PPI mis-selling claims that had already been decided and determine based on the varying factual scenarios um, whether they were likely to win or not to succeed in their claim. They gave the same information to the AI platform and um, what do you think the results were? I mean, the lawyers got 62% accuracy, which is OK. The AI platform got 86%. So in terms of using predictive analytics, if you can use that in a practice to advise your client 
about the likely outcome of their case, that could be really useful. But taking another example of document review, there was another experiment in the US that um, put 20 US lawyers, top lawyers, against LawGeek's AI platform, which you had on your slides there, and they had to review five non-disclosure agreements and identify 30 different legal issues in the documents. Um, the lawyers, I think, got about 85% accuracy in terms of identifying the issues, but the platform got 94%. But in addition to that, in addition to the accuracy levels, the lawyers took on average 92 minutes to review those documents and the platform took 26 seconds. So there's obviously a lot of efficiencies that can be... It's a tragedy for drawn. time costing. <laughs> well, this is the problem. <laughs> this is exactly where the disruption happens because fundamentally traditional law firms are six-minute units, billable hour. Uh, so uh, they're not really incentivised to use artificial intelligence or technology to and increase efficiencies when they're not being paid to do so. So that requires a review fundamentally of their business model, but in particular their pricing methodologies, uh, to see how they can incorporate that artificial intelligence or technology and still make money. So that's where we're starting to see disruption. But I think in terms of what will happen is that it will, it will uh, be adopted by the legal services market more generally and probably by the top four accounting firms who also have law firms, um, and the disruption will come from the big players who are willing to invest in that technology. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so we've touched on a whole range of issues, and now it's over to you guys. Um, uh, there are microphones around the room on either side, and there's a gentleman right up the back. Because I've got lights in my eyes, it's really quite difficult to see you all, but I'll do my best. Um, so, a couple of months ago, with all the Facebook reveals, one of the scariest ones I heard of was they said they'd been doing artificial intelligence analysis of photos for the last several years, and that included identifying the location where possible of every photo, who was in the photo, and then starting to infer the social groups of those people in the photo, and saving that all as data that they would then use in cross-marketing, etc., etc., etc. How many decades until the legal system catches up with that abuse of privacy? Um, I heard that Facebook uh, had uh, an algorithm that could work out from five data proxies whether you were gay or not. Um, and, and they were, um, if you had liked Lady Gaga, if you had liked dancing, if you had liked, what's another popular female, Katy Perry, if you'd like Katy Perry, and there were two others, there were television shows, then Facebook um, could, uh, could say whether you were gay or not with a 95% accuracy. I, th I think you touch on um, the themes that, um, that Joe um, has, has spoken about during his, during his lecture. Um, it's about time. It's about time we actually um, put some law into place to do that. And in order, in order to do that, we need to have a proper policy debate or a pop, proper um, policy response to it. And there's a real paucity of that in Australia at the moment. I'll tell you yeah. Yeah, If I can come in on a minute, um, that's a very interesting question, especially because. Most probably under the current set of rules, Facebook not only has done nothing wrong, but it's actually got your consent for it. It actually got you to sign off on it, right? And remember that there are so many of those agreements where I agree to do this. So um, I don't know whether Ancestry.com and 23.com have become popular in Australia too. But how many uh, people who have sent off the data um, to check their genetic uh, ancestry have actually noticed that they've signed away the rights to their data and that the company may do anything that they like with it? And in fact, you know, some colleagues of mine had, um, for a laugh, actually set off on a website uh, which was 
subscribed to by hundreds, um, they actually put in a clause where the user signed their soul over to the yes, dead. Yes, it's a great one. <laughs> yeah, we, it's a great one. We've seen that. Yeah. And, and, oh, it's and my favorite. They, and the point is, people don't read this. In fact, in one of my research projects 10 years ago, I actually put in, 50, I, how many do we have? 9,000, 10,000 online users in Europe, where we asked them exactly the same question that Eurostat was saying. So I had seen this Eurostat survey which said um, 78 or 85 percent of users read privacy policy. I said, no, nah, it can't be, you know. And we went out and we, find out, we found out that 85 percent didn't read them, and of those who read them, only 11% understood them. <laughs> so you're now at a point where you're saying, not only are we signing off on stuff we don't read, but on stuff we don't understand, which brings us back to the point is to a question which arose in many focus groups, which was, isn't there a law against it? Or there should be a law against it. We, those were the two answers we got most. There should, there, there's surely a law against it. And the point is, no, there isn't. There isn't. Because, and that is what I was saying in my last slide, that it should be a matter of information policy, going with what Paul Seacart had said in 1983. It's a matter of encouraging the right flows, discouraging the wrong ones. And if we think that it's wrong, that, for example, that kind of face recognition is carried out, and that kind of matching is carried out, we should say so. There should be a law against it. But for now, we've been gathering the evidence base. The only problem is that while we've been gathering the evidence base, in the meantime, the companies have got the technology working. And some governments out there, one of them not so far away, has actually put it into place, and 1.3 billion people are living under, in a society where the face recognition, the AI, the big, the big data analytics have come together in a form of social engineering, which has never been known so far. It is really scary. I was just going to say, the, it, it has become increasingly common for people to point out that if you sign up for something free, or so-called free like Facebook, you're actually the product, not the user of it. And I think that is changing a little bit the way that people are um, looking at the extensions, the way in which that data is being used, uh, which is incredible. So if I go back to Victoria developing its you know, state privacy legislation 20 years ago, um, the politicians involved actually had a serious debate about whether or not it would be paternalistic to make privacy decisions on people's behalf. Um, and I remember at the time, like, the example used was, look, if someone wants to sign up for something in order to get a cap or a pen, we shouldn't stop them. But there was no comprehension at that time that getting that cap or that pen or, you know, the ability to have lots of friends um, would lead to the, you know, not, not the future, but, like, the, the position that we're in right, right now. So you could say that the... Um, let me show you, Bridget, let me, let me just, uh, and then we'll see more questions, but let me show you how different the attitude was in a number of European countries, the first, uh, in exactly the same date, right? And I remember that because I was then chairing the group on data protection and insurance. In 1995, Belgium, Austria, a number of other countries legislated into being that you could not request genetic data mm. from a client as a condition for issuing a life insurance. So that is a clear policy decision, which is saying, no, we don't, we think that that would be far too coercive. We think that that is unfair. And therefore, we're not going to let market forces play it out here because then the whole notion of insurance law and the spreading of risk is thrown out of the window. Because then it becomes, oh, so I've checked, Joe is much more susceptible to having uh, cancer than David is, and therefore we're going to charge Joe a much higher price, and therefore the notion of the spreading of risk has gone out. So 
And this is 23 years ago, mm. right? And the point I'm making here is, if you think about it far ahead in advance, you can bring in the law. The law is not necessarily an ass. It's an ass because we make it an ass. Well, we did, we did agree, Australia did agree that uh, health insurers shouldn't get hold of our health data. Um, so that's one that they're actually capable of recognising. But you seem to have changed your but, mind, haven't you? <laughs> yes. But Australia was never given <coughs> adequacy under the old uh, EU directive. And of course, 95 was also an interesting time for privacy in Australia, because people were scared that if the EU directive came in, we wouldn't be able to do business with Europe anymore. And, and it was the, one of the main reasons why Australia's, um, the federal legislation was extended to the private sector. I mean, it is funny, but, you know, the, one of the main reasons why we could never be given adequacy was because an enormous exemption was carved out for small business. Now, I, I'm technically a small business. I don't earn very much money. But, you know, small businesses can earn, what is it, up to six million now? Three. three yeah. It's more it's than three. three. It's gone up. Yes, it's gone up. Yeah, it's gone up. So it's, um, it's a, I, I think that's, you know, a sizable amount of money and you should be responsible for any personal information that you collect and handle. But... I think it says a lot about Australia that small business had to be protected from The privacy. whole point, Bridget, is why should, why should money be the metric? I know. Because if you have a company with 10 or even 5 tech-savvy people who are earning less than 3 million or whatever, 4 mm. million, the amount of damage they could do with millions of people's records... Um, is terrible. And that is the key question, and that's why Europeans, for one, have never gone towards asking the question, is personal data property, and if so, whose? What they've said is, who controls it? And what's the impact, and how can we protect it? So ownership is irrelevant. It's the impact. That is important. I won't say anything. I don't. Yeah, ownership and privacy and personal information is absolute nonsense. But yeah, I think we should have more questions for you. There's a question down the front here. Just what you're talking about now raises the whole question of value and currency. We already have things like Bitcoin that uh, another type of currency, and our information is currency in this in these contexts, how can we be empowered to actually change anything? <laughs> well, I just, because I, I sort of I, finished with it, I, I'd say I have a lot of sympathy and I myself like, am tempted towards technical solutions that can monetize. I mean, I do know social media, but can monetize basically so I get the value instead of the company. If I was to do that, it would be because I'd think that, you know, maybe there are lots and lots of outliers like me and together we could break down the big boys. It's not going to happen, but... I, so my real, uh, and look, I don't know how you do it, but I think Joe's points about like what it is to be human are probably the ones that, that I will certainly be spending my time focusing on in relation to privacy. But I understand why people want to look at those. And in fact, I mean, they were also not, not given a Guernsey by the federal government, um, even though I don't see any reason why you shouldn't promote uh, ways of giving people more control over their data without going down the path of either open data or um, data ownership, which is just nonsense. So, yeah, you, yeah. One of the things, I, I, I wasn't aware of those percentages of, you know, how AI beat the lawyers, um, but one, one of the things that, uh, that um, I, I've seen suggested is that um, one of the ways to deal with AI is to put AI into the hands of individuals, um, for, for um, us to be able to deploy our own technical solutions against those who would seek to deploy technical solutions against us. And, and, and I'm wondering, like, you know, those, those AI lawyers, yeah. you know, might do a, a lot better in terms of uh, running the litigation and establishing a right to privacy through the courts. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think? It would certainly be a lot more efficient. <laughs> I think... Um, I think fundamentally the issue with AI and combining that with legal practice is that, um, you know, when we think about lawyers and we think about regulation, and law is one of the most highly regulated industries in the world, there's a reason for that. It's about protecting people. And so if we're talking about AI practicing law, we have to think about 
whether that falls within the regulatory regime. And at the moment, there's a lot of cases, particularly in the US, that talk about unauthorised practice of law because machines and technology are making decisions that um, lawyers should be making. So it's really about uh, examining that regulation and looking at reforming it so that you encapsulate those organisations that aren't, aren't regulated at the moment. So I wonder what Rudy Giuliani would have said about uh, legal professional privilege with uh, President Trump's AI rather than Michael Cohen. Can I quickly chip in on this Bitcoin thing? Because um, the question is a very pertinent one. The lady who asked the question about Bitcoin uh, might have noted that that's also related in many societies to um, anti-money laundering legislation, right? So lawyers have been rapidly increasing the, num the amount of regulation which exists in Europe. They're now at the fourth money laundering directive and talking of the fifth money laundering directive. But in actual fact, um, if you examine the amount of restrictions which now exist for financial data, people's financial privacy has kind of disappeared. And that means that we're now looking at a situation where people are looking at the regulation of things like Bitcoin, like Hawala, etc. And why? In order to try and manage a risk. And which risk is that? Right? Money laundering, tax evasion, etc. But in actual fact, the German constitutional court, since we have lawyers in the room and we should also, you know, try to keep them happy too. The German constitutional court has come up with a doctrine of the holistic approach to law, which is, some might argue that the money laundering approach, for example, in Bitcoin, it, on its own, it's, it's, it's no way to impinge on people's privacy. But if you take that law with another law, with another law, with another law, that new law might actually be the one which breaks the camel's back. And all these measures together, when they come together, would um, actually put mankind into a position where privacy and informational self-determination and Persönlichkeitsrecht, as the Germans mm. call it, the right to personality, um, would be thrown out of the window. So that has actually introduced a new legal test, that every time a law goes in front of the German Constitutional Court, the judges of the court feel themselves free to not only look at the new law on its own, stand alone, but also the impact that that law would have with 10, 15 other laws which also impact privacy. And that's something else which perhaps one should put into law into Australia. That the, the courts should not only have legal standards which are clearly set, which are not there yet, but we should also have this approach to considering everything in the round and the whole. And to look at rights holistically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. I'd like to know how we get back on track. I'm talking Australia specifically here. Because what we see from government is not a strong desire to protect citizens. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, so what's the incentive for politicians to actually make it an issue that isn't a, a bipartisan policy to continue to erode privacy? You know, particularly in a climate where we see the My, My eHealth records, for instance, when it was tried as a voluntary scheme in Tasmania, you know, almost nobody adopted it, so it was a complete failure. So government's response is not to learn from that to say people don't want it, but to say, OK, we'll make it a, an opt-out system. Um, and we're not seeing a, a huge, massive campaign now, despite the coverage in media, for people to actually push to opt out. You know, we, we have a public that doesn't necessarily want to or have that energy to fight, um, and governments that don't necessarily have the, you know, any incentive to, to do things differently. How do we break out of that? Do you want to invite Louis? Louis, did you want to? And then we, we can have more of a dialogue? Yeah. Thank you. This, this question is linked because 
I think we, 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 we live in a very interesting time at the moment with the My Health Records that we'll probably in future return to quite often and analyse. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to blame the individuals involved. Um, yes, because... Um, Me? In, okay. in, 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 no, I, I'm not looking at you, Richard. <laughs> I'm, looking at, I'm looking at everyone because they, we, we look at privacy policies and why people tick off. Uh, just on boxes. Why don't they read? Why don't they? Uh, why don't they enforce their rights? Um, on the other hand, I work in many countries where we're bringing people into the digital world who are barely literate. So I see the 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 limits of the movement towards empowering the individual, so that the individual can push back uh, against the state when it tries to overreach itself. Um, but if you look at ourselves as a society, uh, this afternoon I've just been looking at results from, from focus groups. People are making assumptions that disempowers them. They are making assumptions that information that should be protected is not worthy of protection because it's already been lost. They are uh, making assumptions that the risks involved are far less than they actually are that someone is actually looking after proper security because the, the information is valuable. So surely no one will take this without protecting it. Assumption. And then they're making assumptions that the benefits they get are going to outweigh the risks. Now, following on from Andre's question, how, how do we move societies ahead and, and, and empower people to really participate, to decide honestly, whether they want to participate in, in the debate and the discussion and to feel passionate about it. Because if you make all the wrong assumptions, you lose the passion because there's no real need for you. There's nothing really serious at play. I'm game. Um, <laughs> Are you all game? Okay. First of all, I suggest that you have to take a multi-pronged approach. You don't do one thing, you do many things. And you think about changing the tide within 25 years, 30 years. Though we have to start stemming it within 25 months. Firstly, as you correctly said, Louis, you have a very important problem, which is ignorance of how the systems work. And that ignorance can only be tackled through education. And what I've been saying for a long time now is that my attitude to privacy, to freedom of expression online, to appropriate or inappropriate behavior by states online, to cyberbullying, to cybercrime, you've got to take pretty much the same approach that progressive states take to sex education, right? which is start them young, don't wait until they're 14 or 15, you know, start them at five, seven. And as a matter of policy, you teach about online risks, about what metadata means, about how data is being gathered about you and how it can be used and abused. Teach people too about protections they can use, right? Teach about the equivalent of electronic condoms. Teach about encryption. Teach about a whole bunch of stuff. But that's one thing, and that's in the long term, in the long run. Remember that in some of the cases we have in emerging economies, education is still a problem. So here I am talking about education in, Sid in Sydney or Melbourne, but if I'm talking about uh, education in Nakuru, in Kenya, where people still have to pay for private education, for education in public schools, and it's beyond the reach, you are really looking at a huge um, differential when it comes to means and how to make privacy. Somebody told me recently, but Joe, isn't privacy a rich man's first world luxury? Uh, because in the third world, people are worrying more about food and water and shelter. Um, and I could go into that in some detail. But 
I think also you have to look at, to go to the question, how are you going to reclaim that? You're going to reclaim that through citizen action and education. Because in reality, especially in a society where apparently after Super Saturday, you now have a 10% swing and lots of more marginal seats, which is the only language that politicians understand? It's the loss of power. So basically, if through a actions of citizens which have a multiplier effect, which result in more and more people knocking on constituency surgery doors, tell them, I don't want it, I won't have it, and then you won't have it. And that's the way it should go. Now, the La Trobe organisers are looking at me severely. <laughs> <laughs> because we've, uh, we're, we're, we've run over time, although we did start a bit late. Um, I think... To also just sort of wrap up and deal with Louis and Andre's sort of combined question and to follow on from, from Joe, um, you have to make it uncomfortable for politicians. Um, and, and, and one of the difficult things about privacy is that a lot of the techniques of sharing information, the technologies behind it, are so complex and the laws have become so complex. The laws and their um, exceptions and exclusions have become so complex that um, our, our, rights be, our, our, our rights or our understanding of what is happening to us is becoming opaque as we are becoming more transparent. And um, so I think um, politicians only understand power and being out of um, um, being tossed out of office, and it's up to us. It's up to us to make those sorts of issues count, and to hold public officials and to hold politicians to account. And the, the, the final thing I will say is that it's really interesting how big data is deployed on uh, on uh, for predictive policing to pro to to um, to work out. Uh, who's going to be committing crimes at certain times, or, um, is, or, or to look at credit risk. Where is that coming from? Um, <laughs> um, it's, it, 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 it's incredibly rare for politicians to say, uh, let's, uh, let's use advanced analytics to work out um, which people who are applying for political office or who are attempting to be elected, are more likely to be corrupt, are more likely to run off with our money. <laughs> and I think that's the note I would like to leave you with tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there will be a further event on artificial intelligence in line with this theme um, that um, we will... Uh, Joe mentioned earlier, privacy by design. Um, uh, that was invented by Anne Kavukian. Anne has uh, agreed to participate in a further event on AI. She's developed some principles um, about AI by design. Um, watch your social media very carefully. Um, um, and also the Latrobe marketing team and events team, because that event will be held um, probably in about six to eight weeks. I'm not quite sure, but it will be happening. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Professor Kanatachi has asked us, are we going to be smart or are we going to be dumb? Uh, and he's encouraged us to avoid being stupidly surveillable, um, which uh, is a word that we must have in English now. Uh, and he talked about clothing manufacturers putting sensors in our tracky dacks. Uh, now, personally, I'm horrified by that prospect, and I think you probably would be too. Um, Seriously, though, uh, I was delighted, uh, uh, Professor, that um, a National Charter of Rights was part of the solution. Mark Dreyfus, are you listening? Um, Rob Hulls listened here in Victoria. Uh, we need rights. Um, why aren't we rallying in the streets? Um, I'm old enough to remember the Australia Card debate back in 1987. Remember that? Remember how we got our first privacy legislation in Australia in the first place? when the federal government wanted to introduce a, a card for us all to carry so that we could uh, get benefits, and they extolled the virtues of this system and said, 
It's a wonderful thing. You'll all have a card. It'll make life easier. It'll save so much money. Uh, and uh, we were outraged, weren't we? Uh, those of us who are alive then. Uh, and we were all outraged and they introduced legislation. They, they ran away from their Australia card and they introduced legislation to protect us. So uh, perhaps that's the answer now. Um, we're not going to th just thank you once, uh, Professor. We're going to thank you twice. Uh, the first person who's going to thank you is Julia Osilio. Um, if you'd like to join me up here. Julia is one of our um, JD students at La Trobe who's performing exceptionally well, I might add, uh, and she's going to say a few words uh, to thank you, and then I'm going to thank you as well. So with the first vote of thanks, Julia Osilio. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction, Patrick. I really am uh, delighted to be here to represent the JD students at La Trobe University at tonight's event. I think the collection of topics we've discussed tonight, being big data, privacy and artificial intelligence, really are so important. And it's ultimately the lawyers of my generation who will have to continue to grapple with all of these issues that we've discussed tonight. Now, I know I speak on behalf of all of us when I say that we are really honoured and so grateful that you accepted our invitation to talk with us here tonight, Professor Kanatachi. And we are also so pleased to have the insights of our Latrobe panellists, uh, Professor David Watts, Mira Stammers and Dr Bridget Brainbridge. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julia, and I'm going to give um, some very heavy gifts uh, to our, our friends, <laughs> very heavy indeed, uh, and uh, invite you to join us uh, in the uh, foyer for uh, canapes and drinks, uh, and I'm sure um, you, 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 will, you will understand that the, the key message from tonight is that we have to be all kinds of clever uh, from here on in, uh, and if you, if you really want to be all kinds of clever, then of course you'll consider uh, a Juris Doctor a Master of Cyber Security Law or a Master of Legal Entrepreneurship from La Trobe Law School. Please join me in the foyer and please join me in warmly, warmly thanking Professor Joe Kanatachi for his exceptionally stimulating talk. <laughs>